um, and director, Katherine Skinner, and the rest of the SPIN staff, maybe a couple of whom are on today, uh, and members as well. I'm also the research program officer at Educopia Institute. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started and dive into our program. Uh, all but the hosts and the guests will be muted throughout the webinar just to maximize the audio and visual quality of this recording. So if you have any questions during the presentation, we ask that you type them into the chat box, the Zoom chat box, which we will be monitoring closely throughout, so that if we do have a backlog of questions throughout the course of the presentation or the discussion between Brandon, Leslie, and Henry, we will queue those up and they'll be ready for, for Q&A. We'll go in the order that they were uh, presented. So every, uh, every episode will be recorded. Um, we're recording right now. It will be transcribed and posted to the SPIN website, freely available for all. As a reminder, today we're presenting episode two, Beginning the Preservation Workflow. And this is a discussion with members of the Code of Best Practices research team and two of our esteemed guests. The first, Leslie Johnston, Director of Digital Preservation for the National Archives and Records Administration, with the responsibility to develop and execute a digital preservation strategy for the agency. Ms. Johnston has over 35 years of experience in the cultural higher education and federal communities, including the Getty, Stanford, and Harvard University Libraries, and the Library of Congress, where she worked with digitized and born digital collections setting and applying standards, and overseeing the development of the digital content management and delivery systems and services. Her expertise includes digital collection management systems and infrastructure design, digital preservation systems, and standards for digital collections. We're also joined today by Henry Lowood, Curator for History of Science and Technology Collections and Film and Media Studies Collections at Stanford Libraries. After being trained in the history of science and technology and receiving his PhD from UC Berkeley, over a period of 35 years, Henry has combined interests in history, technological innovation, and the history of digital games and simulations to head several long-term projects at Stanford, including How They Got Game, the history and culture of interactive simulations and video games in the Stanford Humanities Lab and Stanford Libraries, the Silicon Valley Archives in the Stanford Libraries, um, and Archiving Virtual Worlds collections hosted by the Internet Archive, just to name a few. He's led Stanford's work on game and virtual world preservation in the Preserving Virtual Worlds project funded by the U.S. Library of Congress and the Institute for Museum and Library Services, and the Game Citation Project, also funded by the IMLS. Henry is also the author of numerous articles and essays on the history of Silicon Valley and the development of digital game technology and culture. And your research leads and facilitators for today's episode are Brandon Butler, Director of Information Policy at the University of Virginia Libraries, who's joined by Peter Yazi, Professor Emeritus at American University Washington College of Law. Professor Yazi is one of the originators of the Fair Use Best Practices Movement and is co-author of the Software Preservation Code of Best Practices for Fair Use uh, in Software Preservation, along with Brandon, uh, Pat Ofterheide, and Krista Cox. So this is the continuation of our seven part series of webinars that explore the fair use code and other legal tools for software preservation, co-hosted by the Association of Research Libraries and the Software Preservation Network. And with that, I will hand it off to Brandon. Great, thanks Jess. So we're really excited to join you in this second episode in our seven, F seven webinar series. Uh, you know, by the time this thing is over, it's gonna be warm. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, we're going to talk today about the first two principles in the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use uh, for software, preser Whoa, software preservation. And uh, let me give you a little overview, a uh, roadmap of the talk. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off by talking a little bit about principle one, uh, and then Peter Yazi will talk a little bit about principle two, and then we're going to hand it over um, to our guests. Uh, Henry and Leslie to talk about their experiences in the field. Uh, so first, Henry's going to talk a little bit about uh, the Cabernetti collection and, and some of the, his adventures in the world of agreements and contracts uh, in particular, among other things. And then Leslie will talk about the, the joys of uh, collecting and preserving the digital government record. Uh, uh, so then we'll have time for discussion. And uh, I think uh, we wanna make sure that folks are able to ask whatever questions are on your mind. And if you uh, 
uh, were on the last webinar and there were things you didn't get to bring up last time, uh, there's no uh, bar on talking about whatever, uh, whatever is on your mind related to the code. Um, but do keep in mind, we're only going to have Henry and Leslie today. So you, if you've got questions for them, do be sure to get those in while we've got them on the line. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the very first principle of the code. And uh, I think we probably mentioned last week that the code overall is structured in a kind of um, uh, progression so that each principle, you know, follows roughly um, chronologically a workflow of software preservation, starting with, you know, a box of media on your desk and ending with, you know, a, the, the, a, a cyber utopia where everybody can read everything no matter how old it is, right? Um, and so the first principle is getting from box of stuff on your desk to software in your collection, right? Or software that's part of your tool set for managing your collection, as uh, Leslie will talk about later. And so uh, principle one covers um, accessioning, stabilizing, evaluating, and describing those digital objects, that software objects. And that includes um, the kinds of things, and we didn't talk a lot about the process of developing the codes, but the, the codes are developed by speaking with practitioners, right? Like Henry and Leslie. Um, in confidence, you know, uh, and in small groups as well as uh, uh, individually about what they do. And so um, these, this process tries to mirror what people told us they do when they're, when they're trying to preserve software. And so that includes things like making multiple disk images of original media, um, documenting what the original media packaging might have looked like, um, uh, other materials that were associated with the software, making notes about that, but also running the software so that you can tell what it is and what it does and how it works. Um, all of that stuff that happens sort of at your workbench, right? When you're processing the collection, you're figuring out what's in it, you're getting it from unstable, unmanaged to stable, managed, described, it's ready to be a thing that you're caring for. And so that's why I, I chose our little forensic computer pal over there is the image. I know my colleague Lauren Work has one of those things and it costs more than my first car. So <laughs> um, fair use better lets you use that thing because it's way too expensive to just sit there on your desk. Um, each principle has a set of limitations that are associated with that principle. And these, this is the way that all of these codes work. Um, in the focus group discussions that we led in the, in, in the process of developing the codes, we probed the consensus to say, well, at what point would you feel uncomfortable? Or what are the things that you feel are important to be considered as part of, uh, as part of working your way through a situation like this one? Um, and so, you know, one of the first ones, which seems sort of maybe goes without saying, but it came up a lot and with some vigor was, you know, you really need to have preservation activities that relate to your mission. Um, you know, this was something, literally the first thing that anyone, you know, the first thing that any group, had, you know, within 10 minutes of our first focus group discussion, this emerged as, you know, we, we put out a hypothetical question and the group immediately said, well, why are we doing this, right? You need to tell me that this is a part of my mission or I'm not going to do it. So you need to have a relationship between the preservation activity and the mission of your institution. Um, for donated materials, donor agreements are just so important. Um, we heard over and over again, you know, uh, as you're conducting this activity, you're protected by fair use, but, you know, donor agreements intervene at the same time. And you, you can't sort of run headlong uh, forward without remembering the other sources of obligation that might come into play. Um, reasonable care, again, at this stage, uh, to identify content that's sensitive for other for non copyright reasons, and this is part of being a good actor. Um, so the sort of it's sometimes referred to as kind of a fifth factor, and lawyers and law professors debate about whether this is good or not. But I don't think there's much debating about the fact that judges actually care whether you show that you're a good actor. And so the community actually, without us telling them that a judge is going to make you do it anyway, said this is what we do. Um, we take care to, you know, 
take account of the things that we're processing that might need to be flagged for non-copyright reasons. And that's part of being a good professional. Um, descriptions should be created, expressed, and shared to facilitate discovery within and where possible beyond the institution. And this was another one that uh, where we heard over and over again, you know, we're not going to do this if we can't actually make these things findable. Uh, part of what it is to preserve something is to describe it and to make it uh, a part of a collection that someone can find and use, whether they're inside or outside of whatever circle of users we're thinking about. We want to describe it in a way that it's findable to people. Um, so that was an important part of, you know, stage one, when you're getting started, consider your user. Uh, and then uh, finally, at this stage, and this is important, thinking chronologically, right? For the purposes of principle one, the people who are handling software uh, for this purpose should be personnel, including staff, volunteers, contractors. So it's not, you know, we don't, we don't need to see your badge, but there needs to be a, an affiliation, um, whether at the home institution or at a partner institution or a vendor, who are directly engaged in this kind of activity. You know, you need to be doing preservation at the preservation stage, containing access for that part of the work. Access comes later, and we'll talk about the terms on which access is provided later, but in this phase, access is limited to the people who are doing the preservation work. Um, so those were the limitations. They're, I think, fairly, you know, fairly like robust and interesting, but not limiting in a way that I think going to constrain anyone from doing what they see as an important part of their mission, and I think that's a good place to end up. Um, so now I will turn it over to Peter Yazzie to talk a little bit about Principle 2. Thank you, Brandon. And I, I want to start by emphasizing something that, that you have just said and that I think we said already when we were discussing the project last week, and that is that we learned very early when we started to talk to the professionals in the field who were kind enough to work with us, including very early on Henry and, and Leslie, that the mission of software preservation was not simply a preservation mission. And of course, this is true of almost all, if not all, archival activities. That is to say, preservation on the, doesn't make any long-term sense, as certainly not as a, as a, as a way of, of expending significant resources if it isn't for purposes of encouraging and facilitating access. And so the next three principles in our, in our code are really all about different varieties of access to preserved material. And one Peter? Of yes, indeed. Just a brief uh, request. Is there any way that you could speak slightly closer to the mic? I'm sure I can. Okay, perfect. Uh, Thank you so much. Not at all. Um, the, what I had said a moment ago is that one of the first things we learned is that the preservation mission and the, the access mission are all tied up together. One can't really be separated from the other. So the next three principles, including the one I'm about to talk about, are focused on the, ask, the access side of the, the preservation activity. And one of the first things we learned when we started to talk with the generous experts in the field is that it's often important for collecting institutions to create and make available visual and audio documentation of legacy software in operation. That might include uh, screenshots of videos of software in operation or software in operation being controlled by an expert user. There are lots and lots of dimensions of software which are, are difficult or impossible to capture fully in a textual description or even in a, an emulation experience. And all of that is good and straightforward and intimately mission related and in, in some sense profoundly non-controversial. 
was shown. But copyright is an issue because the protection that copyright provides actually goes beyond code itself and extends as well, at least theoretically, to various kinds of software generated displays. So you have at least to think when you create products or, or versions of software to document its operation that are going to be shared and seen by various publics, you have to at least think about whether or not you can do that in compliance with copyright law. And the happy answer is yes. This turns out to be really a very straightforward, fair use question. Last time we talked a little bit about the ruling concept in contemporary US fair use jurisprudence, which is this idea of using something for a transformative purpose. And this is a classic example. Obviously, when I, when I present documentation of the, the operation of a software program, I'm doing something very, very different from what that program, whatever functionality that program was originally designed to accomplish. So this was easy. It didn't take the small groups that deliberated with us about the appropriate meets and bounds of these best practices very long to decide that in the broadest sense this was a clear obvious and important example of fair use and then we have the limitations and those are pretty straightforward as well the more the better in in, in where context is concerned is the the first limitation, fair use and transformative purpose are always easier to demonstrate when you are showing and telling more about the context of the thing that is being demonstrated. Won't always be possible to provide rich context, but when it is, it should be done. The second limiting, limiting proposition here is really just a restatement of a general fair use concept that I explained a little bit last time. Everyone cares, including the courts, that when you use something without having expressed permission to do so, the extent of your use should be commensurate, appropriate, proportional, pick your word, they all mean more or less the same thing to the purpose. So the more the more extensive your goals, the more documentation is justified. And then finally, there's the last limitation, which, which came up and, and a number of our groups thought it was important to, to include. I have to say that this one is, for the moment, and I, I fervently hope that that will change, more, more of an aspirational than a real limitation. That is to say, were the copyright owners of legacy software themselves to go into the business, so to speak, of providing extensive online documentation of their legacy products in action, especially if they were to figure out a way to monetize that activity, then perhaps collecting institutions would want to step back and leave that market to them. But so far, at least, there have been few, if any, indications that that is or is likely to be taking place. So remember it. But for the moment, I think, um, don't, don't, don't feel particularly constrained by it. And that's really all there is to it. This is about as close to a, a, a carte blanche as we're going to see with respect to any of the fair use propositions that are contained in the code itself. Thanks. There we go. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> um, uh, and so we've said a, a little bit about those two scenarios in overview, but I think it's going to be really interesting and useful um, for y'all to hear a little bit from Henry and Leslie, and especially, I think, and you know they will correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, their illustrations will bear me out or not. But I think they have a nice complementary aspect to their two use cases because 
Henry is really someone who's collecting software to, for software's sake, um, and Leslie is collecting uh, digital documents, and she needs that software to make sense of the documents, as she'll tell you more about later. And those were really, in a way, the two mega overarching use cases that we heard about over and over again. Um, so uh, starting with Henry, uh, I, I'm really excited to hear from you all about what it's really like to do this stuff. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm really happy to talk to all of you out there. Well, I'll be talking mostly about a collection at Stanford, the Cabernetti Collection, uh, which is a collection on the history of microcomputing software and features a collection of about 15,000 to 20,000 pieces of software. We don't know an exact number, never really have, because there's a lot of uh, magazines with software and uh, all sorts of things, everything you could imagine that, that could complicate a, an exact count. I'm going to focus. Focus, I think, mostly on situation one about access, accessioning, stabilizing, evaluating, and describing digital objects, um, specifically around a project to create disk images from original media. And in doing that, I'm going to focus on the second limitation, limitation B. Uh, just to remind you, what that one says is where materials have been donated, their preservation should be undertaken in light of the terms of donor agreements, which may limit reuse and access. Um, they may limit reuse and access, but of course donor agreements can also, uh, I'll argue, help you with access. They can augment access in some ways. Uh, use case again will be this, uh, the Cabernetti Collection, and in particular, project, one of the projects we carried out with the Cabernetti Collection with the National Institute for Standards uh, and Technology. Uh, specifically, the, what's called the NSRL, the National Software Reference Library, run by Doug White, which I describe as the National Forensics, Software Forensics Laboratory. Now, as for Situation 2, Documenting Software in Operation, I'm not going to say too much about that directly, even though it pains me greatly not to. Uh, it's, that, that particular thing is uh, something that's occupied me quite a bit, both as a historian and as a curator, I've written about it uh, quite a bit. My one sentence description of what I would say is that documentation of that sort is at least as important to game historians as access to operation, operating software um, of the past. Um, I'm gonna leave it there. If you have questions, if you wanna talk about it in Q&A, we'll, I can certainly do that. So back to the Cabernetti Collection, the full name of which is the Stephen M. Cabernetti Collection in the History of Microcomputing. We acquired this collection at Stanford in 1998 and 1999. That's 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. Uh, I will <clears throat> state right now, I believe this is true, that it was the first acquisition of a software collection by any repository. Um, I've written a little bit about that. Uh, you can look for an article called Software Archives and Software Libraries that I wrote in a, a recent book in the Smithsonian Studies in the History of Science and Technology series, basically about the history of software collect, collecting. Uh, and so again, the Cabernetti Collection has been around at Stanford for over 20 years, and we are still working through projects to deal with the workflow that leads you from acquisition to full access. Uh, the current project <clears throat> being the EASY project, we're finally at access. Um, the project, uh, of course, is one that uh, the Software Preservation Network has set up for a number of institutions to participate in, including Stanford. Now, I'll be talking about, when I say software, I'm talking about packaged PC software, productivity software, game software, edutainment, all those sorts of things. I'm not talking about mainframe or bundled software, as it used to be called, unpublished software, scientific or research software, there's sort of academic software, if you will. I'm not talking about non-PC software, newer things like mobile, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, mobile software, things like that. Uh, <clears throat> some of what I say I think is applicable to streamed and downloadable software, but, uh, some of it's not. Uh, and we actually do have a little bit of downloaded software from uh, bulletin boards and things like that in the Cabernetti collection. Um, now, if I were talking about some of these other topics, like for example, academic software, some of what I would say would be a little bit different in terms of agreements and things like that. Uh, and again, I, I'm not gonna dwell on that. I'm just gonna say if you have questions, 
about the, those categories of software, some, some of which I definitely have worked on, um, feel free to ask later. So in terms of workflow, we've been working on the Cabernet collection now for over 20 years, as I've said. Uh, this work's largely been carried out through a string of funded projects, some of which um, Jessica mentioned in the introduction, included the two Preserving Virtual Worlds projects funded by Library of Congress and IMLS, uh, the NIST uh, Cabernet Capture project, which I'll be talking about, uh, the Game Citation project, also funded by IMLS, and now the Easy project. Noticed in that sequence, started with sort of a, just acquis what's out there, what, what could you acquire project, followed by a capture migration project, followed by a description project, followed by an access project, and here we are 20 years later. Um, these have all been multi-institutional projects, including Stanford. So back to the point about fair use and the specific point that where materials have been donated, their preservation should be undertaken in light of the, ter in light of the terms of donor agreements, which may limit reuse and access. And I'm gonna put this uh, point in a slightly different way. Um, software preservation involves um, a kind of a complicated game. And the, the players in that game include um, copyright law, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and so forth, the very, various provisions and, and things there. Fair use, which of course we're talking about today. Contracts, in the sense of shrink wrap agreements and things like that. And then specific agreements with donors and rights holders. So all of those things can come into play in different, in different ways and interact in different ways. Sometimes you have uh, something in one category, but nothing in another category. Sometimes uh, you have multiple agreements and uh, concerns about copyright law and all sorts of things playing together. It's kind of like uh, a game of a complicated game of rock, paper, scissors, figuring out that sometimes, you know, fair use may be beats copyright law here, while maybe in another occasion, a donor agreement would trump fair use, you know, and so on and so forth. So it's quite complicated. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? Let's see if this works. Or did I put Brandon to sleep? Oh, there it is. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so here's the deed of gift, of course, and the acquisitions process in my area of, of curatorial practice uh, you know, sometimes I, I do buy individual software titles. We do have a, a media center where we do that sort of thing. But with the historical software, it's been mostly around collecting collections, uh, acquiring collections. And these uh, have mostly been gifts, um, beginning with this instrument called the deed of gift. Um, by the way, the Cabernet collection, alas, the one that we've been doing all this work on was acquired in 1998. You can imagine, you're looking at the current template for a deed of gift at the Stanford Libraries. You can imagine the horror that you will experience when you look at a deed of gift uh, done in 1998 uh, in terms of its applicability to the projects that we're doing today. It's really it involves another layer of translation in that game that I described of figuring out how the terms of a 20 year old uh, agreement will apply. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, you know, we offer. One of the most important conversations whenever you um, talk to donors concerns how to handle copyright in the materials that are donated. Uh, in our current template, a donor gets to choose from three options, uh, transferring copyright to Stanford, granting Stanford a license, uh, which you'll see in, the, uh, in a minute, uh, or just saying nothing about rights. The key point, however, is that these choices are only applicable to the extent that the donor owns copyright in the materials that they're giving to you. Um, you know, or other IP rights potentially like patent rights, which has come up on occasion. In the case of the Cabernet collection, this did apply to a portion of the collection we were given. Exactly three titles out of the circa 15,000 titles in the collection were copyright to Stephen Cabernet. 14,997, let's say, were not. So this, portion of the agreement only applied to those three titles and, to, and also to his personal papers that were included. So that's one thing right off the bat. These agreements often um, don't address uh, the copyright issues because the donor doesn't own copyright in the materials. Next slide, please. So here for completeness are the other two options that are available to the donor. Um, take a few seconds to browse option uh, B. Uh, which is our preferred choice. 
This option grants Stanford a license to carry out pretty much any migration or reformatting we'd like to do, as well as granting us the right to provide what we call world access via the web. But again, the key point, the donor can only grant this license if he or she is the copyright holder for the material. Uh, and sadly, you know, this is generally not the case, as I just said. Uh, and, and of course, in the case of the Cabernetti collection, this option was not stated, uh, was not available at all because, well, you know, 1998, right? Uh, we just didn't think about these things back then. Next slide, please. Uh, this is here, again, pretty much just for completeness. Uh, the same options uh, that I've mentioned before, the same three options would also be available in the case of collections that we buy as opposed to acquire as gift gifts. And yes, uh, we have bought uh, collections on occasion and we've acquired copyright on occasion. That's another thing I wanted just to mention briefly is there is an option in a sale, sale as well as in a gift to transfer copyright. Uh, and there's even the option of acquiring copyright straight away, say for some, for a collection that you already own. And we've done that on occasion. I just, I, I just want to put those on the table. Wow, that was amazing. That was a mind read uh, slide advance. Um, okay, that's fine. That's, that's where we want to be. Uh, so we did this project with uh, NIST, uh, which created a big collection of disc images. And just as Brandon said, sometimes when you're doing preservation, you need to be thinking about what's going to happen down the road. In fact, you probably won't even do the preservation if you're not thinking about what's going to happen down the road. You need to think about access, uh, even while you're supposedly focusing just on preservation. So the focus of the project with NIST was to capture software from original media, create portable disk images, then that could be stored in the Stanford Digital Repository, and theoretically could be seen and downloaded um, by researchers. In addition to the disk images, we also created photographic images, uh, thus complicating the word image for us forever when we can't refer to images now and know whether we're talking about disks or photographs. By photographic images, I'm referring to photographs of the physical media, the carrier media, photographs of the boxes, the box covers from all sides and photographs of the inserts such as manuals um, and you know other things that were inside the box. So we anticipated research access to the software right from the beginning as we were designing the project and had lots of discussion about what we thought we would be able to do. Uh, this involved remember those players I was talking about thinking about copyright law, thinking about fair use, uh, this was 2012, 2013. Uh, we didn't have the fair use document that you have now. So we were pretty much guessing. We didn't really even have um, a lot of the documentation that ARL has compiled for other kinds of uh, materials that we might have used in a kind of a transfer to software. Uh, we were pretty much guessing. And finally, we got tired of guessing and said, in this case, we're going to uh, mount a parallel project to contact the rights holders for the software uh, we were migrating. And this letter that you see here in the slide is the letter that we wrote to, um, to the rights holders we contacted. We began with the rights holders who held the most titles, so your Activisions, Microsoft, and so forth. Uh, we didn't go very far down the tail. Uh, we still plan to do that. But um, we're, it, it, there are, if you can imagine with the collection of software from the 1970s and early 90s, many of the companies on the long end of the tail don't exist anymore. And, and um, we'll have to think about how we do that. Now, next slide, please. So this is what we asked of the rights holders. Um, we said, we're contacting you for guidance about the level of access you will allow us to provide to your materials. And we would ask them that, that question, as you'll see in a second, we'll, we provided them with some options. That would then be documented, and we wouldn't need to care about copyright law or fair use or any of that stuff after doing this, uh, because we heard from the rights holders and they said exactly what we could do. Uh, that was the hope. Um, we felt that this would um, eliminate uh, this game that I was talking about and enable us to pr proceed without ambiguity. Uh, the next slide. So here's what we sent 
uh, we sent something like this to every rights holder we contact. This is uh, from the letter to Strategic Studies Group. We listed the software titles we had identified, which stated that they owned copyright. So that could be on the disk or on the box or something inside the box it says copyright SSG. We're contacting you about these titles. And we, first of all, we said, we asked them to verify indeed that they did own copyright. The next slide. And then we asked them for permission, uh, according to this uh, simple grid that you see here, both for the disk images and for the photographic images. World access is unlimited over the web, allowing download and all of that sort of thing. Research use only would be some sort of access with no permission to redistribute or copy, such as no downloads. And then restricted research ac uh, research use only is basic, would also include reading room access, I should mention. Restricted research use was if you've got some something that you've got a problem with, let's talk about it and figure out uh, a special case here. And um, OK, next slide, please. Uh, so I'll conclude here. I actually you can go back to the last one. We can just stare at it while I'm talking. That's a little more to look at. So again, we contacted rights holders about titles we thought they owned copyright to. And there was every reason to think that due to statements on software boxes and so forth. Here's what we learned from their responses. The first thing we learned, I think was the major thing, was we had discovered a new category of orphan software, which is, uh, if you think about that SSG list, there were 10 titles there, or say a Microsoft or an Activision to whom we might have had 200 or 300 titles. Um, typically, we received back um, confirmation that they owned, felt they owned copyright or were willing to assert copyright to half, two thirds, three quarters. Many titles for which we were certain they owned copyright, the purported holders said they did not own it. Uh, at least they were not willing to assert it. There were a variety of reasons for that. Um, if you want to know some of those reasons, let's save that for the Q&A. Um, secondly, we, were, we learned that we're not going to acquire world access for very much. The total right now is up to about 15 titles out of 15,000, so less than 1% do we, for which we have unrestricted access to the disk images. However, um, and, you know, in those cases, we're mostly uh, dealing with what we call reading room access. Um, however, for photographic images, uh, uh, we've received permission for world access that is unrestricted uh, almost in every case. So uh, this suggests that uh, the rights holders are maybe less concerned about certain kinds of documentation around the software, at, uh, about they're less concerned about restricting access to them than they are about restricting access to the software itself, which, uh, and I'll conclude on this last sentence, uh, kind of circles back to the second, um, the second case that we discussed uh, concerning documentation and its importance, that's a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel indicating that probably with documentation, we're not going to have very many problems uh, with rights holders. Okay, I'll stop there and uh, hand over to Leslie. Awesome, thanks Henry. And I'll just, uh, I'm switching over to Leslie's slides here. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, all right, I'll go. All right, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so we need to start with sort of some context for what we do at the National Archives. And the most important question is, do we actually collect software? Um, we don't explicitly collect software, but we collect the permanently valuable records, permanent records of the federal government. And if an agency identifies code or software that they have developed as a permanent record, then it does come to the archives. This is uncommon so far, but it is not unknown. Um, I have a variety of different types of code that we have gotten from agencies, um, some of it Java, um, that's actually the largest category of, you know, code that we have gotten in. Um, 
most of the code that's created by the federal government is in the public domain. So it is different from Henry's situation where he is bringing in primarily commercial software um, or open source software that was created through some sort of license. Um, most of what we get is public domain unless it was created under a contract that had terms that overrode that status. So it's really incredibly rare that we get the same sort of proprietary software that Henry gets. What we do have is over 1 billion files, actually it's over 1.5 billion files in our permanent record holdings, so federal and presidential, that are born digital, that date back to our first transfers in 1968. So we've been bringing files in for over 40 years, which means we have over 200 versions of file formats created in a variety of packages in different operating environments that have come into our collection. Next slide. So the, the context for formats for us is that we issue guidance, uh, which we call transfer guidance for the agencies that have to send materials to us. So it's about the media types, it's about the file formats, it's the metadata. Some of this is actually in federal code, uh, but most of this is guidance. We don't actually have a record type for software or code yet. We have record types for textual, for GIS, for databases, for email, but not yet for code because we have received it so irregularly. Um, we're not able to be prescriptive about what we receive. Um, we have concepts of preferred and acceptable formats, and that's approximately 50 formats across all the record types. Like we prefer PDF-A to other forms of PDFs. Uh, we prefer open standards um, to proprietary standards such as the Microsoft Suite. Um, but this is real life. So the agencies do the work in the environments where they do the work. And as you can imagine, agencies, the work of those agencies goes from, we just do email or documents or spreadsheets or presentations to the scientific agencies such as NOAA or NASA, where they have observational data as well as code that they have written to work with that data at those agencies and because we have the variety of work and we have the longitudinal you know question about what we're getting in we are always going to have to have flexibility and we're always going to say take the record even though it doesn't meet our guidance versus we don't want to preserve the record in our holdings next slide so the way that federal agency transfers to NARA work are that agencies identify records because they know their records better than us, uh, but they do consult with NARA on which of their records are temporary, which means it has temporary business value to the agency, no permanent value. These are working files. They're not going to come to us. And then a schedule is agreed upon for the disposal where they're given the authority to dispose of their temporary records and then are required to transfer their permanent records to NARA. This again is where we come into some interesting questions about not only the records, but I swear I'm getting to it, the software, because it can be, they could hold on to it for five years, 50 years, or as we heard a couple of weeks ago, 500 years. We had an agency tell us that their records have value for the life of the physical structures that they are responsible for. And that one of those structures, the Hoover Dam, the records related to the building and maintenance of the Hoover Dam will have business value for as long as the dam is in existence and they apply this same standard to permanent records and retention for all of the structures that they are responsible for. 
So as they told us in this call, we will not be getting most of the Hoover Dam records for 500 years plus 20, because they add a plus 20 to everything just in case. Next slide. So what does any of this have to do with software preservation and fair use? So as Brandon mentioned, we have two use cases. The smaller use case is that we do receive code from agencies. But the more prevalent use case for us is that given that potential for lengthy periods of retention by agencies, the uncertainty that they will be able to migrate files over time, because I will say that federal records managers, that category of position in the federal government has to be one of the most underfunded and understaffed areas of the federal government. Um, and there being such a variety and vintage of formats, as well as the software and operating environments, we need older software packages to be able to validate, process, describe, and migrate the files that we have in our holdings now, will have into the future, and will get in the future. Next slide. So the workflows for bringing in code or any type of born digital record is the same. We have a single workflow for accessioning, processing, ingest of born digital records. So agencies let us know that there is a transfer that they would like to schedule. They have to tell us what schedule it is and what type of materials these are, both in terms of record types, but also the intellectual content. Um, are these emails? Are these press releases? Um, are these, you know, project management records so that we can actually confirm that what they're sending is what we expect to receive and that what we've received is what they claimed they were sending. So our workflows are not unlike any other digital accessioning, ingest, and preservation workflow. We need to validate that they conform to the format that they purport to be. Are they really PDFs? Are they really drawing files? Are they really Java code? Is it um, compressed or uncompressed? We want everything to come to us uncompressed. Is it compiled or uncompiled? If we get code, we want it to come to us uncompiled. Um, and the confirmation that the intellectual content meets the requirements of the record schedule. If they send us things in these transfers, then, and they don't meet that, we do not take them into the permanent collections. Um, as I mentioned with um, compression, we also require that any materials be transferred to us without encryption. So things must be uncompressed and unencrypted when they come to us, and that include, includes code. Next slide. So, Agencies are expected to transfer supporting documentation along with the files that go into that transfer dossier. Not surprisingly, this can either be present or absent or be highly variable in terms of the granularity of documentation that they send us for things like data sets, databases, spreadsheets. We hope for some sort of, you know, XML, JSON, we expect for some sort of documentation of the data schema or the markup schema. We don't always get that. Um, so our processing archivists have to work with whatever it is that we have gotten. So we need to make copies for ingest if the files have received come to us on media. And that can range from coming in on a USB stick to coming in on an entirely racked server environment, depending on the scale of the transfer that is coming to us. We run format characterization tools to identify if they are or aren't what they say they are. We attempt to open and or run them, and I will be circling back to that activity. Uh, we have to review them for PII. Uh, because we will get, in particular, data sets that come in with PII. And as a separate activity, we do also receive classified materials. And that can include code that comes along with things from, say, the Department of Defense. We need to describe them. 
and we need to create processing notes about the state of the files and the associated environmental requirements for not only us, but for researchers to interact with them. And from our point of view, um, even though our records and our code are um, public domain, we have created processes that we believe are in line with the code of best practices that we're talking about today, you know, especially principle one in terms of how we actually process code for our holdings. We do not make any recordings of the um, software in use if we have received it or any other interactive materials that we have received. Um, we don't record user interactions. We don't, we don't generally ever receive packaging. So we don't create any sorts of images that would relate to principle two. Next slide. So even though we're focusing today on principles one and two, I need to talk a little bit about principles three and five, about the work that's necessary for preservation and the work that's necessary to provide access. So the Federal Records Act requires that agencies send us their records, including code, in a manner that actually, you know, explicitly allows NARA to provide the access. So we do indeed retain and preserve the original format of the files. We create public use copies and we provide access to the holdings in common formats, but we also provide the original formats by, as requested, and we believe that our activities are in line with the code of best practices. Next slide. Um, but as Brandon mentioned, what this means for us if we have 1.6 billion files in well over 200 variants, uh, this means that we must have software to process the records as well as potentially provide access to them. And that's slightly out of the scope of the core principles, but if you look at the Appendix 2 in the Code of Best Practices, that's a section that I recommend to every archivist who deals with born digital materials uh, and take to heart when you discover inevitably that you will need legacy or vintage license software and operating systems that are required for the processing and preservation of your collections. Next slide. So uh, that's it for what I wanted to make sure that I covered as sort of the introduction to how we do things and the issues that we have come across in our work. And now I throw it back to Brandon and everybody so we can have a discussion about this. Yeah, thank you so much, Leslie, Henry, Brandon, and Peter. Um, we do have a few questions queued up for today's Q&A. So we'll take some time to review those now. I will take a moment to encourage everyone to continue to paste their questions into the chat. Um, we may be developing a backlog of questions. If we don't have time to answer them today, I'll continue to repeat that we will address them over the course of the series, and they may be addressed explicitly in writing on the post that includes the publication of the recording. So the questions we have for today, um, there was some follow-up uh, about Henry's presentation um, most museums provide images of their objects in their collection, including copyrighted materials. So just a follow-up question for Henry and Stanford Library Policy in terms of what the concern was about providing images of the physical materials. Well, <clears throat> the image of the uh, carrier format would probably be analogous to what, the, what museums do, and that was not the part we were concerned about. The part we were concerned about were things like the manuals and the boxes themselves, which the manuals um, are text and are certainly covered by the copyright that the uh, publisher owns over the software title. Um, box covers, um, similar argument could apply, although as we know, uh, in, the, in the age of Amazon and so forth, box covers and things like that fly around uh, quite easily, it would be very unlikely that a that a 
that a publisher would have a problem with that. But we were pretty concerned about things like manuals, basically the booklet inside the, uh, the box. Uh, maybe I should backtrack and remind people that there was a time when software included a printed manual. Uh, so, uh, the, and in the era we're talking about of the, of the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, that was quite common. Some of them, I'd say, uh, went up to about 200 pages. There are, are games that had, in particular, that had, uh, and, and even productivity software that had quite lengthy manuals. And uh, so certainly those would be covered under copyright and we wanted to have clearance on them. If I could just jump in for a moment, it's such a good question. The reason that museums provide images of things in their collection is because they feel correctly that they can rely on the fair use doctrine. To do so, so the the question and the and and the project of today are very closely related. Perfect. Um, so that's that's our first question. We also have uh, this is also a follow on from Henry's presentation, and so so Henry, if you could speak to this, and maybe um, Peter, as you did just now, or Brandon, or Krista, or Pat might speak a little bit to the broader context for this. So this was a question about why um, particular donors maybe think that they don't own the rights or particular software companies think that they don't own the rights. So this was maybe uh, hearkening back, Henry, to your um, information gathering phase when you were initially doing permissions. And I would like for um, the attendee that asked that question to please step in and correct me if I've gotten the thrust of your question incorrect. Okay, I'll, I'll just go ahead and then uh, feel, uh, if that question wants to interrupt and say I'm going in the wrong direction, feel free. Um, well, donors, of course, um, rarely have copyright over everything they give a library. You can imagine if somebody gives their collection of magazines or software to the library, they generally will own copyright in none of it. Um, and in the, even in the case of their papers, very often they'll they're donating things that they don't own copyright to. Uh, in the case of the publishers, that's the more interesting thing. The publishers we contacted for whom, um, you know, we were relying on copyright statements uh, in the materials that we had that stated that they own copyright. And now we go to the publisher and they tell us we're only willing to assert rights on about half the title or two thirds or whatever the number would be. Why is that? Bunch of different reasons. Um, and keep in mind here that we're talking about software that's at least, uh, in, the, in the youngest case, is 25 years old, okay, in the Cabernetti collection. Um, but that's not, doesn't explain everything. It might be that um, the company has a policy of not answering a question like that unless they can locate their contracts. And guess what? They can't find the contracts for the software from 1982. Uh, it might be that licenses reverted. Uh, this is a thing that um, I work on film and media as well. It's a thing that uh, I don't see very much discussion about in library land about how rights sometimes uh, due to contracts will change. A very famous example of that that has caused me no, no, uh, <laughs> no limit of grief over the years is the famous uh, Macintosh commercial, the 1984 Super Bowl ad from Apple where the rights reverted to Ridley Scott from Apple uh, after a certain number of years. And uh, it's been very difficult to get Ridley Scott's attention <laughs> to let us uh, uh, deal with some things there. Um, so rights revert. Sometimes uh, they're sub licenses. Sometimes um, there might be, well, a good example of that would be music uh, soundtracks. Uh, that's true of games, game software, for example, just as, as much, much as it might be for a television show. Uh, if any of you have seen uh, the TV show SCTV, Second City TV, the DVD of it, you'll notice there's blackouts in the, in the, on the DVD. And that's because some of the musical performances could not, they couldn't go back and revisit the rights on that man to, to black it out. It can be the same with a game. Uh, an example of that would be um, Doom, uh, where the uh, musical rights, there was a sub-license involved with that that affected the distribution of the um, version of game of the game for which the source code was released, and that might be a reason 
that a company like Electronic Arts is not willing to uh, assert their rights because they're maybe not sure that about music rights or something else that's underneath, or it might even be a piece of software that uh, is within the software that, that they've distributed. So there are lots of reasons that uh, it turns out can orphan a piece of software as far as permission goes that you thought uh, was unambiguous in terms of its um, uh, in terms of the ownership of copyright and, and, and that I think I may have even left out some other factors that came up but I think that, that uh, those were the most common yeah thank you so, so much Henry and I'll, I'll I want to open that up to um, our research team Peter Brandon uh, Krista and Pat to respond and then due to time I think we'll have to wrap it up after that however we do have a queue of two to three other questions that we will pull forward to episode three so I'm about to jump through the screen if you don't if you didn't notice and I want to get this out there before we get to the last thing. <laughs> the great thing about fair use is that this is what it's this is what it was meant to do is to solve this problem if you're, you know, if, if you are a startup that wants to cash in on the vintage gaming trend by rebooting Doom and selling it for the iPhone, then copyright makes you go and get permission, and that's good. You should. You're going to make a lot of money. You should go find whoever wrote that music and give them a piece of it, and if you can't find them, you can take it out, and that's okay, and that's the way copyright works, and that's good. Copyright was never, since 1790, supposed to discourage research and learning. And so when, when you get people like Henry having to go through this process, that is not what copyright intended to do. Um, you know, it's, it's, for the reasons Henry described, getting permission can be wonderful. It's not a waste of time. If you think you're going to get it, it's great to get it. But if you hit a brick wall, Copyright is never supposed to be a thing that prevents research and teaching in this way. And fair use is the safety valve that lets you do this. The principles we've been describing today are the reasons, are the principles that will let you do the things that when you hit that orphan work brick wall, fair use saves the day. So go forth and uh, fair use <laughs> is the <laughs> no, that's excellent. And what I'll do is I'll be sure to highlight that uh, that last portion, the actual like minute time, while Brandon says, and here's fair use. This is the problem that it solves. So um, that was a wonderful episode. As always, just a huge thanks to the entire uh, research team. That's Brandon, Peter, Pat, and Krista. And warm, warm thanks to our esteemed guests today, Henry and Leslie. Um, also, sincerest words of appreciation to each of our attendees today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And join us next week, same time, same place, for episode three, Access Within Institutions and Across Networks. This will be featuring Jonathan Farwitz of the Guggenheim Museum and Ewan Cochran of Yale University Libraries. So next week's episode will be facilitated by Krista Cox from the Association of Research Libraries and Peter Yazzie of the Washington School of Law at American University. Thank you again to all of you and we look forward to next week. Bye everybody, thank you. Thank you. And thanks Henry and Leslie. Thank you for including us, Brandon. Yep, You're thanks. welcome.